started here. As soon as this says that we're live. Okay. We are now streaming, so I am gonna get started. I'm gonna take a second, I just wanna share my screen, share a little bit of a, a nicer image with everyone. Great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Ryan and I'll be hosting our webinar today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take a second to acknowledge what's happening in the world right now. Um, for the past week, we've seen protests around the country. And personally, um, I wanted to say that I stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and that I will continue to educate myself on the best way that I can be an ally to our communities of color, not only here in Florida, but across the country. And for any of our Environment Florida members that are interested in getting involved with that or, or are just feeling overwhelmed at this time, I encourage you all to reach out to local groups that work on those issues. Um, but to what we're talking about today, um, I am our climate and clean energy advocate for the Environment Florida Research and Policy Center. Um, and right now I'm getting to work on some of our oceans issues. So I'm really excited to hear more about our oceans and have you learn more about our oceans with me. Um, just to reiterate, Environment Florida is a statewide, citizen-based, um, nonprofit dedicated to protecting our clean air, clean water, and open spaces. Tonight, or this afternoon rather, we're going to be learning about the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary as part of Environment America's series, Our, Ama Our Amazing Oceans, um, and in preparation for World Oceans Day, which is coming up on Monday. Um, before we jump into hearing from our speakers, I wanted to share a little bit more about why I care about this issue. So I'm actually from the Midwest. Um, I grew up loving our lakes, not our oceans. Um, but it is something, there's something really awe-inspiring about our oceans. I remember as a kid going on vacation to Florida. Um, it really was Florida where I first got to swim the ocean and fell in love with kind of the magic and the wonder that they, that they have. Um, as I got older, I got to visit different parts of the world. I got to go snorkeling and spend more time among reefs and different sea life. Um, and it continues to be something that I want to explore and learn more about because they are so beautiful and I know how important they are now. And um, I hope that we get to talk about that a little bit today. So as a new Floridian, I know there are a few things that we care more about than our beautiful waterways and our beautiful beaches. Um, we're going to have a deeper understanding of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary specifically today. So we are going to hear from Marlise Tumolo, um, who's an educator at the Florida International University in support of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And we're going to hear from Chris Berg, the South Florida um, Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And I'm going to get let Marlise um, start off with telling us more about the sanctuary, its history, and and how it was designated a, a National Marine Sanctuary. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me here today. Can you all hear me OK? OK, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, if you all could let me know when it's when you're seeing it. Are you seeing it? No. OK, let me try that one more time. Okay, sorry folks. It just said that host has disabled participant screen sharing. Can you guys just give me screen sharing access, please? All right, you should have access. All right, there we go. Okay, how does that look? Looks great. All right. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me to be here today. As, as Ryan mentioned, my name is Marlise Tumalo. I'm a program coordinator. Um, I, I work for Florida International University in support of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, I apologize, folks, for that. Um, yes, so I'm here today to talk to you about National Marine Sanctuaries. So what are National Marine Sanctuaries? Um, National Marine Sanctuaries are designated through an act of Congress called the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. And these are areas of the marine environment have particular um, special conservation or recreational or ecological um, 
importance. And so for that reason, they're designated to be protected around the country. And really, these areas focus on resource protection, but they also allow for public use. So national marine sanctuaries um, across the sanctuary system are open for the public to visit and enjoy. As I mentioned, we have a system of these marine protected areas across the country. So you can see here a map of the National Marine Sanctuary System. Uh, there are currently 14 National Marine Sanctuaries and two Marine National Monuments within the sanctuary system across the country. Um, and we protect more than 600,000 square miles of Marine and Great Lakes waters. So a very large system of marine protected areas. We're here today to talk in particular about the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And to give you a little bit of history, at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the first part of the sanctuary was actually designated in 1975, and it was called Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary. So you can see this map here. Oh, I apologize. You can see this map here shows this little box. This is Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary. And then in 1981, Lou Key National Marine Sanctuary was designated down here in the Lower Keys. So we had these two separate National Marine Sanctuaries in the Florida Keys that were protecting the marine resources. Um, and then what happened is, as our country was experiencing uh, a lot of different things, it was the wake of the Exxon Valdez oil uh, spill in 1988, and there was a consideration of oil drilling along the Florida coastline, or coastline, it was being considered. So there was some kind of environmental concerns happening in the area. And then in addition to that, there were three major ship groundings that happened in a 17-day period across um, the Florida reef tract here in the Florida Keys. And these three ship groundings caused, as you can imagine, a good amount of damage. And so what this did is this caused Congress to act. And in 1990, in November of 1990, uh, Congress proposed the designation of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So 1990, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Protectin Protection Act <laughs> was signed on November 16th by President George H. Bush. And it did three things immediately when it was signed. Uh, it prohibited oil and gas development and hard mineral mining so that there couldn't be any drilling along the coast here in the Florida Keys. It also established a water quality protection program to address concern, water quality concerns in the area. And it, it also restricted commercial vessels that were larger than 50 meters from an area to be avoided that essentially was outside the reef line. It was outside the reef line. And in addition to that, it provided a little bit of a buffer zone of the reef. So this allowed ships to still transit off the coast of Florida, but without the concern of running aground on the reef here in the Florida Keys. So the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is unique because it's, it's co-trustee management with the state of Florida. So the state of Florida and the federal government co-manage this protected area. Approximately 2,900 square nautical miles is protected around the Florida Keys. And you can see the boundary layout here in this map. And it really shows you that as soon as you put your toes in the water, in the Florida Keys, you're within this marine protected area in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So the boundary of the sanctuary is from mean high water to about 300 feet on the ocean side, and it goes out on the bay side in the upper keys and um, connects with Everglades National Park and goes down around the dry tortugas in the southern part of the keys. So it's a, it's a large protected area. There are three national parks that the sanctuary actually borders. It borders uh, Biscayne Bay, Everglades, and Dry Tortugas National Parks. So the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, why is this place important? Why are we protecting it? It's the only coral barrier reef in the continental United States, um, which is a pretty, pretty special thing. There's approximately 1,800 miles of mangrove shoreline that are protected within the sanctuary. 1.4 million acres of seagrass meadows, more than 6,000 species of marine life, and 800 or more underwater historical sites. So in addition to protecting the ecological components of the Florida Keys, we also protect the historical sites that tell the history of our 
maritime past. I mentioned that the sanctuary is co-managed with the state of Florida. Uh, there are a lot of different folks who are working on protecting the coral reef ecosystem here in the Florida Keys. Um, you can see that the coral reef ecosystem really does start on land with our hardwood hammock. Um, it goes out to our mangrove, seagrass, coral reefs, and then offshore. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary spans that entire area in terms of protection. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, covers state waters as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then in federal waters, you also have the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and NOAA Fisheries. So there's a lot of different folks working together to protect this special place. While we work to protect the special place, there's a lot of different threats that we face that we have to consider. Um, this slide shows a lot of different threats, um, but it's it's really just a kind of a tip of the iceberg. You can see here that we have concerns over grounding. The top two images are of a vessel that grounded here in the Florida Keys, a recreational vessel. Uh, there's concerns about water quality issues. This image was actually taken um, by Coast Guard and FWC when they boarded a vessel. Uh, you can see we have marine debris concerns, marine debris in particular in the wake, and particularly in the wake of hurricanes, but really just year round because of our ocean current movement patterns here in the Keys, we see a lot of marine debris coming in. Anchoring can disturb our coral reefs and cause damage. We have concerns about invasive species. Not mentioned on this slide, um, we have warming ocean temperatures being a concern, coral disease, and many other factors. So it's important to us as resource managers to take into consideration all of these different components to try to protect these resources. With that in mind, we have a few sanctuary-wide regulations that um, we put into place to try to provide protection. The first one is that you are not allowed to, so these are all prohibited sanctuary-wide. So you're not allowed to injure or possess coral or live rock. You're not allowed to operate a vessel in a way that will injure resources. So you can see in this image, those are prop scars from a vessel destroying seagrass. You're not allowed to operate a vessel at more than no wake within 100 feet of residential shorelines, stationary vessels, or navigation aids. You're not allowed to anchor on living coral or discharge pollutants into the water here. And then when you're operating within a diver down flag, you have to, or within 100 yards of a diver down flag, you have to operate at no wake. So these are kind of sanctuary wise wide components to think about. In addition to these sanctuary wide components, we have various zones within the sanctuary. So it's we're really unique because the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary established the nation's first comprehensive network of marine zones in their management plan that was released in 1997. And as you can see on this slide, there's various different zones to consider when you're down here. And what these zones do is they actually separate user conflicts so that people can recreate in the sanctuary and not have to be concerned about user conflicts. And they also separate uses to prevent damage in highly important areas. If you're interested in more learning more about sanctuary zones, I included a link here and I can also share those with Ryan after the fact if anyone is interested. Um, but this is a great tool for exploring all of the different zones in the sanctuary and then the various regulations that exist within those zones. In addition to these different sanctuary zones, we have our mooring buoy system. Uh, we maintain a system of over 800 mooring buoys across the Keys. Uh, boaters can use these mooring buoys at popular sites to visit, to snorkel, to swim. Uh, they're a great way to get out on the water and access the sanctuary. Um, and then they also mark no take zones. So if you're in an area where there is no fishing or it's considered a no take zone, these mooring buoys can help to distinguish that. And what we you would look for on the water for that would be these yellow, um, what we call spa balls, uh, sanctuary preservation area. And these are our no take zones. They're marked in the, around the perimeter by these yellow balls. Another strategy that we use to try to minimize um, negative impacts to our resource here is boater education. Uh, we did create through our sanctuary, in partnership with our Sanctuary Advisory Council, a free online course that boaters who are coming to visit the Florida Keys can take. It's available in both English and Spanish, and it focuses on how to boat in the sensitive marine environment 
uh, without causing damage. So it's a great resource that's out there. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to floridakeys.noaa.gov and you can take the free voter education course. Another way that we partner in the community to prevent damage to the resources here in the Florida Keys is our Blue Star program. We have two different programs, the Blue Star Diving Program and the Blue Star Fishing Guides Program. Uh, this is a recognition program. It's voluntary and it was established by the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And the goal is to reduce diving and fishing impacts on the ecosystem in the Florida Keys. And the way that we do this is the Blue Star Program partners with charter boat operators. They agree to um, train their staff to a higher standard, conduct certain onboard briefings, and just kind of be aware of the best practices to minimize damage to our ecosystem and then to implement those best practices at their business. So if you're ever coming to enjoy the Florida Keys and you're looking to book a fishing charter or a dive and snorkel charter, we encourage you to visit the Blue Star website, sanctuarybluestar.org, to find out who some of those partners are that we work with. Another program that we have that really focuses on resource protection is the Goal Clean Seas Florida Keys program. Uh, this is, again, a partnership with uh, scuba diving and snorkel operators, as well as local businesses and volunteers to remove marine debris from Florida Keys waters. So this program was developed in 2017 after Hurricane Irma to address the immense amount of debris that we saw in the wake of the storm. And the first year of the program was extremely successful. And to date, they've removed about 30, we've removed about 30,000 pounds of submerged marine debris from the sanctuary. Again, this is an opportunity to, for folks to get involved. Um, once things are kind of up and running at a normal rate again, we do have regular cleanups with this program that participants can come down and engage in. Um, last but not least, at least for today's presentation, uh, another really important initiative that we have down here in the Florida Keys is Mission Iconic Reefs. Over the last 40 years, we've seen a decline in coral reefs in the Florida Keys. Uh, nearly 90% of live corals that were once dominating the reefs have been lost in certain areas. And with that in mind, we feel that emergency action is required to really change the path of reef health here in the Florida Keys. So NOAA and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary with many, many other partners, including restoration practitioners have identified certain iconic reefs. You can see them here in the, um, in the photo that are going to be restored over a long period. So a lot of these areas have status quo, currently have about 2% coral cover. And in phase one, they're looking to outplant and restore those areas to about 15% coral cover. And then in phase two, they're looking to move up to 25% coral cover. So this is a very exciting project and partnership that's happening here in the Florida Keys to restore our reefs. Okay, that's the that's it for my intro to the sanctuary for now. Thank you, Ryan. Are there any questions? Um, I think we are gonna go through Chris's presentation and then we'll do a huge Q and A at the bottom. Um, I saw some comments um, in the chat box that people are having a hard time hearing. If you're having a hard time hearing our speakers, feel free to message me directly through the chat box. If you're having a hard time sharing your own audio. We can turn that on at the end, um, but we wanted to work through the presentations before we got to the Q&A. Um, so feel free to put your questions in there and we can definitely come back to them. Um, but otherwise, I am going to, there you go, um, pass it on to Chris Berg from the Nature Conservancy. And he's gonna be touching on some of the environmental value that the uh, sanctuary brings as well as the economic value. Okay, thank you very much uh, to Environment Florida for the uh, opportunity. Um, my name is Chris Berg and I am the South Florida Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy. I'm based in the Florida Keys in Big Pine Key, uh, but I actually grew up in Key West. I've uh, been here since the early 70s and I've seen a lot of amazing things out on the water and under the water uh, and I've seen a lot of um, unfortunate uh, challenges like what Marlies described um, the Nature Conservancy, if you're not already familiar with our organization, is an international 
uh, 501c3 uh, nonprofit conservation organization. Uh, our mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And uh, from our perspective, that means plants and animals and um, people as well. So people depend upon nature in an in incredible variety of ways. And this presentation that I'm gonna give you is going to uh, really focus first on the, the wildlife, the natural um, species and so forth and then get into the benefits that people derive from the coral reefs and the um, other marine habitats. Oops. I've lost my own screen. Are you still seeing my screen? It says no, it looks like a black screen. Um, mm. Maybe if you hit the oh. escape. There you go. So um, you're going to see a few of the same images that you saw from Marlies. Thank you for sharing, Marlies. This one, um, 6,000 species. And I suspect uh, that as time goes on, that number is only going to go up. Uh, these are 6,000 of the, the obvious larger species, the things that are easy to see and, and find on the reef or things that particular scientists have studied over the years. And just this particular photo with its, um, you know, every color of the rainbow between the, the green moray eel and various uh, fish, orange sponges and um, red sponges, algaes and you name it, uh, really reflects the diversity. You know, every color of the rainbow, we've got every sort of marine organism um, making its home in the Florida Keys. Uh, that diversity is uh, both the foundation and one of the strengths of the, the ecological system, uh, but also of how people um, depend upon and derive their, uh, whether it's their income or their, um, you know, their quality of life from enjoying these marine resources. We've got um, large critters like the, like the green moray and of course sharks and um, large fish of all kinds, but also uh, lots of tiny little things as well, right down to the, the tiniest shrimp and crabs and things that um, you would never see without a microscope. Offshore, we've got pelagic uh, species, and that means uh, open water, deep water species like this mahi-mahi or dolphin fish, uh, which um, is famous for its fighting abilities and its beauty and its um, delicious fish sandwiches that it makes. Inshore, um, in the coastal waters, we've got sea turtles like this loggerhead sea turtle. This is just one of the five species of sea turtle that you can find in the marine sanctuary. Um, and what it's laying in there are soft corals and sponges. Further in uh, among the estuarine waters and the seagrass meadows, we've got uh, marine mammals like the Florida manatee. And let's not forget um, the things that are spend most of their time above, above the water, like the spoonbills, which are feeding upon estuarine fish um, and are just an incredibly beautiful um, bird, which is not only found in the Keys, but it's one of our one of our special species here. So I've been focusing on the diversity, the variety of different species, uh, but really it's not just about diversity. The Florida Keys are remarkable for the abundance of certain species. So these are tarpon, uh, the famous game fish, which migrates uh, in huge schools through the Florida Keys. Really at this time of year, they're passing through right now. There's a tremendous um, economic uh, boom associated with that for the fishermen uh, who come to target those species to catch and, and release them. And for the charter guides who, you know, provide the, the opportunity to do so. So that uh, abundance is driven by a couple of factors. The diversity and abundance really uh, are driven by a couple of factors, many factors, but some of the major ones are that the Keys sit, the Marine Sanctuary sits at the confluence of uh, the temperate and tropical uh, parts of the world. So the, the cooler climates to the north and the warmer climates to the south, we have species uh, from both of these uh, regions found in the Florida Keys mingling together. And we also happen to sit uh, at the confluence of the Atlantic and the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. So we have uh, species that 
specialize in each of those um, bodies of water and also species that uh, travel through them uh, as, as they make their um, migrations, their life cycles complete. Another really important element of the, the abundance factor, the productivity factor, just how much life there is in this, these waters is the Everglades watershed. So uh, certainly you, you've heard of the Everglades. It's this vast wetland wilderness at the south end of uh, Florida. Uh, not as vast, uh, not as wet, not as wild as it used to be because it's been altered a great deal. The cartoon in the middle shows how water used to flow down from the headwaters through the chain of lakes and the Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee and then slowly um, you know, spreading out and flowing across the so-called river of grass, uh, like the photo in the upper left-hand corner, and then reaching Florida Bay and the southern estuaries, uh, Biscayne Bay, Florida Bay, where uh, the nutrients uh, and the other um, constituents of that water uh, become the base of the food chain and feed plankton and the plankton are fed upon by tiny herbivores and the tiny herbivores are fed upon by uh, small predators and then on up to the, the top of the food chain with the, the large uh, predatory fish and, and people these days. So this, um, it's really a unique and, and incredibly uh, productive system. I, I spent a lot of time several years ago doing aerial overflights of the Bahamas, which are an absolutely beautiful place and very similar to the Keys in many ways. But the productivity is less um, in the estuarine waters there because there's not as much uh, fresh water, not as much nutrient, not as much phytoplankton and on up the food chain. So as similar as it is right across the Straits of Florida, uh, it's just remarkable to compare the number of fish and birds and other wildlife uh, between the two locations. No offense to the Bahamas. So these uh, organisms that I've been describing all specialize in one or more habitat types. So these are benthic or bottom habitats. Uh, these, this is what covers the bottom in the Florida Keys. Just at the south end of the mainland, you see lots of green and different shades of green. Those are seagrass meadows of various species. Uh, the yellow is hard bottom, which is um, flat limestone, mostly dominated by soft corals and sponges. And then the red colors offshore are the coral reefs, the, the bank barrier reefs, which are typically uh, the ones that lots of the diving takes place on, but inter uh, mingled with them. And then in between them and the islands are the patch reefs and various other reef types. I should also point out to the left of the screen that large red area is the Tortugas Bank. Uh, Dry Tortugas National Park sits in the middle of it. Uh, there are marine reserves managed by the marine sanctuary. There are parts of the marine sanctuary, uh, which are just really some of the healthiest, um, largest, most incredible coral reefs um, in the Keys, certainly really anywhere uh, in the United States or the world. They are beautiful and remarkable and very remote. And perhaps uh, it's because of their remoteness that they're in some of the best shape compared to others. So each of these habitats, as I said, has species that depend upon it and other species depend upon multiple habitat types. A lot of our famous reef species like snapper and grouper um, start their early parts of their lives in the seagrass meadows or among the roots of the mangroves uh, in the shallows. And then as they get larger, they move offshore uh, to the coral reefs where they get um, reproductively mature and spawn and release their um, eggs or, or you know, their larvae into the water where they drift for some period of time um, and can spread on up the coast of uh, either the east coast or the west coast of Florida. Uh, or sometimes they stay local and become the next generation of uh, fish or spiny lobster or what have you. Um, that we enjoy here in the Florida Keys. So here's a cross-sectional look at it. On the left, uh, the palm trees represent land. Uh, then in the intertidal areas where you have the high, uh, high and low tide uh, coming and going twice each day, you've got mangroves and a variety of um, other marsh types, but generally mangroves in the Florida Keys. Seagrasses uh, in the uh, shallow 
comparatively shallow areas as long as the water is clear enough for sunlight to penetrate and that allows these plants to photosynthesize they cover vast areas and then generally further offshore we've got these remarkable coral reefs with all of their um, invertebrates from the corals um, the, the stony corals the sea fans and sea whips which you see in this photo which are also corals but they're soft corals um, multitudes of species of sponges which provide the structure the habitat uh, which the fish and the crabs and the lobster and all the other wildlife uh, depend upon for their homes so let me shift gears somewhat uh, to talk about the economic and social benefits that these marine resources provide to people uh, both uh, residents of the Florida Keys like myself and visitors. So this is relatively old data from the, the 1990s, but at that time about 33,000 jobs in the Florida Keys were tied to ocean recreation and tourism. So fishing and diving and boating, and that accounted for more than half of the economic um, um, action in the county and about 2.3 billion dollars in annual sales now almost certainly the uh number of billions has probably gone up quite a bit in the last uh, two decades but those percentages of um or those large job numbers and those large percentages of economic contribution are probably still um, more or less the same today uh, as for perspective, 33,000 jobs, there are about 75,000 people living in the Florida Keys. Not all of them work. Some are children, some are retired. Uh, this is a lot of jobs. A lot of people are deriving their primary income or parts of their income from marine related uh, activities. So a little bit more about the mangroves from this perspective. As Marley said, there are 1,800 miles of mangrove shoreline in the Keys Marine Sanctuary. <clears throat> that reflects not the length of the Keys, but all of the uh, circumferences of the larger and smaller and mid-sized islands. Uh, mangroves are a um, very, very uh, prominent feature of our intertidal environment here. They are vital um, habitat for fish, particularly juvenile fish, as I described earlier. So as those fish grow up and move out to the reef, that's where we tend to um, catch them, those of us that like to catch them. But from another perspective, they are what we think of as green infrastructure. They are a living, uh, self-perpetuating barrier between us and the hurricanes that unfortunately uh, visit us from time to time. And in Hurricane Irma, 2017, September 2017, uh, the mangroves in South Florida, not just the Keys, but all of South Florida, prevented one and a half billion dollars worth of uh, damage to uh, homes, businesses, and infrastructure. If we didn't have the mangroves, we would have had that much more value of our properties lost. So that's a huge number, and this is just one of the many uh, what we think of or call ecosystem services, the things that people derive from native species populations, from native habitats, from natural areas. So those seagrass meadows, which are um, remarkably uh, large, we have uh, really the largest contiguous seagrass uh, ecosystem anywhere in the world uh, in South Florida. And probably the next largest is up in the Big Bend uh, towards, towards uh, Tallahassee. <clears throat> These are, I don't have an economic number for you here, but again, very important for the uh, fisheries. Uh, fish uh, live in them, uh, the juvenile fish live in them, and then move out to the, their adult habitat. And these, as well as the mangroves, are really a very important part of the um, carbon sequestration dynamics that are going on in the world. So as you are probably aware, one of the environmental challenges of the day, one of uh, probably the biggest environmental challenge of the day is uh, human contributions to global climate change. And when we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, it is a greenhouse gas. That means when that gas is in the atmosphere, uh, the heat from sunlight has a hard time escaping from the Earth's atmosphere and it builds up and it gets hotter and hotter slowly. Um, 
And when there are lots of green plants, whether they're terrestrial or intertidal like the mangroves or marine like these seagrasses, they absorb that carbon dioxide into their tissues, into their roots and the what is called the blue carbon, uh, that is the mangroves and the seagrasses actually do an even better job of holding on to that carbon, locking it up and storing it away in the in mostly their roots, uh, even better than the terrestrial plants, which can um, you know, be burned up in fires or rot away and you know release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that is another very important ecosystem service of this very um, large uh, part of the marine sanctuary's environment. And then the reef. Now, the Keys Marine Sanctuary is famous for the reef. It was established, uh, as Marlies said, in part because of the boat, large vessel groundings that were taking place that were destroying swaths of the reef and because of the threat of oil drilling uh, impacting not just the reef, but the entire marine ecosystem. Um, it has, you know, incredible diversity values. Uh, the fishing that goes on there, uh, the diving that goes on there is, um, uh, again, back back to the economic figures, our our number one industry is getting people out there and enjoying these resources responsibly. So here are some more specific numbers, again, from a relatively dated study, but they give you an idea of the magnitude. So this was in the mid 1990s. Uh, there were 739,000 divers that dived in the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary during that time. And that includes residents like myself and Marlies and visitors. We get a tremendous number of uh, tourists visiting the Keys each year and diving on the reef or snorkeling on the reef is one of the primary activities that they enjoy. So among those divers uh, that accounted for 2.8 million uh, diving days. That means somebody went out diving. Uh, so multiple people, like for example, I'm, I may go diving 20 or 30 times a year. So I would account for 20 or 30 diver days. It's a lot of diving. And the economic expenditure, just the people either going out on dive charters or buying diving equipment, that sort of thing was $52 million. I am very confident that it's much larger than that now, but we, we need a fresh study. So fisheries, uh, the Keys are just as famous for their incredible fishing as they are for the diving. Uh, we have both recreational and commercial fisheries. Um, on the recreational side, uh, from this mid 1990s study, we had about 400,000 people fishing, uh, spending about 2 million fishing days and contributing directly fishing related, uh, that is taking charters, buying tackle, uh, buying fuel for boats and that sort of thing, uh, over $100 million to the economy, just in the Keys. And then the commercial fisheries, which have been uh, a mainstay of the economy even prior to tourism, uh, which is now our, our primary economic driver, uh, are also incredibly vibrant. So spiny lobster, which you see in the photo, are the largest uh, uh, economic, uh, from an economic perspective, the largest fishery. Stone crab is the next. And then a variety of reef fish, snappers and groupers and others, make up the third largest. And the, together, uh, those are creating about $92 million worth of economic activity uh, this was in the mid 1990s. Now that figure may have actually, um, it's probably in that neighborhood now, it's gone up uh, and down. Um, generally speaking, uh, uh, and that's not necessarily that there's a relationship here, but recreational fishing is increasing. We have more people doing recreational fishing, uh, fewer doing uh, commercial fishing than we did um, many years ago. <clears throat> so here's another avoided damage statistic. And this is really this, I mentioned the mangroves earlier, how Hurricane Irma would have caused another $1.5 billion worth of damage uh, had we not had the mangroves in South Florida that, that protect our coastline. Uh, this one is focused on coral reefs. And this, these are very new, hot off the press. This is 2019 data. This study was done by the US Geological Survey along with colleagues from the Nature Conservancy the University of uh, California at Santa Cruz 
and perhaps some others that I can't remember. Uh, but it looked at not just Florida, but all of the US uh, states and territories that have coral reefs. So Florida, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and so on, and examined how much uh, the coral reefs are serving as a, a breakwater, if you will, uh, for the, the waves and the storm surges that come along with hurricanes. So this number, uh, just over um, $300 million, is the direct uh, avoided loss from flooding, just flooding, not wind or other aspects of um, hurricanes, uh, for a 100-year storm. That means a storm, we have a one in 100 chance of having a storm that big each year. And a 100-year storm is a big, a big, bad storm. Hurricane uh, Irma, which totally clobbered uh, the Florida Keys was that. Um, I hope we don't get another one like that anytime soon. So with the 100 year storm, a big bad storm, uh, about 24,000 people uh, derive flood protection benefits from the coral reefs in a storm like that. About 5,000 buildings, about 1.3 billion in economic activity and 1.6 billion um, uh, in the value of the buildings. So the, the annual direct value on it, they have a complicated um, mathematical way of figuring out how much annually the, the value to Florida is, and it's just over uh, $300,000. That's, that's avoided losses. That is a storm uh, would not do $300 million in damage um, under those conditions with the reefs that we have today. Uh, and that does not even account for the associated, you know, ripple effects in the economy. So when you, when you lose $300,000 worth of homes and businesses and infrastructure, that has a tremendous negative ripple effect um, on the economy, uh, lost business revenue and so forth. So these are, again, uh, really big numbers, really um, meaningful to those of us that live here, work here, make our living on the water, for those that do. Um, I just want to say another word about how important these natural features are for protecting us and for all the other benefits. So uh, this is Miami uh, and or the north end of the Keys, if you wish. Uh, that island um, sneaking up from the south central is Elliott Key in Biscayne National Park, and it is the north end of the Keys. So the reefs and then the beaches and dunes, the mangroves and marshes, the coastal forests, they are the front line or a series of lines of defense against uh, waves and storm surges, but they also uh, provide water quality benefits. So the uh, mangroves and marshes are filtering water before it reaches uh, the estuaries and that estuarine water, of course, eventually reaches the reefs. They are, as I've mentioned a few times, all interconnected uh, by the, the fish species that spend their juvenile life stages inshore and then move offshore to spawn or breed. And as I've um, highlighted with the previous slides, incredible uh, tourism, or I should say recreational value uh, of these different habitat types and their uses. So big benefits. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, the, the threats that the Florida Keys Marine Ecosystem, the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary, those of us that derive our um, quality of life or our, our businesses, our, our economic um, stability from these resources is very much at risk. Uh, we are, um, as Marley said, down to about 2% live coral cover on average. And that is, um, that's shocking, stunning. When I started to dive here in the 70s, it was probably in the neighborhood of uh, 20, 25%. And this giant coral head in the photo let's say for the sake of discussion, it's 25 feet across, probably took 500 years or more to grow. These um, corals, which are again, the building blocks or the, you know, the foundation of the marine ecosystem, which provide the shelter, the homes for so many other organisms, take an incredibly long time to grow and they can die essentially overnight. So between um, direct impacts from vessels and anchors, um, divers unintentionally or, or intentionally touching them, um, fishing gear contacting them, uh, all sorts of direct impacts are occurring. Uh, 
We've got water quality challenges, including the fact that the Everglades ecosystem needs to continue to be restored uh, in order for the Florida Keys reefs to be at their best. And we also have the impacts of global warming, uh, causing coral bleaching, causing um, uh, exacerbating the impacts of coral diseases, and contributing to sea level rise, which may or may not be a big concern for the coral reefs, but it's certainly a big concern for our low-lying islands. Um, I'm sitting here on Big Pine Key at five feet above sea level. So we do not have uh, a lot of time to waste to get these things taken care of. Um, we've got a lot to lose, uh, but this is a beautiful, productive, and diverse marine ecosystem, and it's ours to protect and to use responsibly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we are going to go back to Marlies for a second. There is some things happening around the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and it's being reviewed um, for different types of protections in the future in different areas. So I'm going to let her go ahead and explain a little bit about that, and then we'll jump straight into questions. Um, feel free to start submitting those questions in the chat, and we will get started with that after Marlies goes. Can you all see my presentation? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, thank you, Chris, for providing that extremely useful and informative background on the marine ecosystem in the Florida Keys. It really is all very interconnected and we all, I think, have a role in protecting this place. And with that in mind, it's a perfect segue into what the sanctuary is currently working on. So the restoration blueprint, um, is an effort to protect the marine resources and habitats in the Florida Keys. And this document embodies what we've learned through more than 20 years of science and experience and community involvement. And so it's a really comprehensive process and we're really excited that it's happening right now. Um, if you're interested in finding out, there is so much background information on this process. It's been going on for years and all of it has been documented and shared. So you can visit this website to find out uh, more specifics, but the Restoration Blue Blueprint is a proposal that was released at the end of 2019. Um, and what really encouraged this process was what we call a condition report. So the National Marine Sanctuary System releases condition reports on the various sanctuaries to better understand uh, how the resources are doing. So this is essentially a resource report card. And in 2011, when the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary report card was released, it indicated that resources sanctuary-wide were in decline. And this was clearly of major concern to uh, resource protection managers, to the local community. And this sparked the beginning of this restoration blueprint process. So in addition to all of those impacts we had um, prior to 2011 that showed that our resources were in decline, um, Chris touched on some of these, but since 2011, there's just been a tremendous amount of impact to the environment here in the Florida Keys. And these are all kind of um, events that have occurred. So you can see that, you know, between the 2014-15 timeframe, we had um, droughts and elevated salinity and warm water mat and a mass bleaching event along the reef. Uh, there was a die-off in the Florida Bay of the seagrass. There's harmful algal blooms. That's this HABs, you see, um, and a sponge die-off in this kind of 2015 to 2017 range. Starting in late 2016-ish, uh, we had a really severe coral disease outbreak that is still ongoing today. Um, along that, Hurricane Irma came and had major impacts. We've also had these sargasm strandings. And so this uh, isn't, this image isn't meant to be um, as shocking as it is when you look at it, but what it really pointed out to resource protection managers and all others down here is that we have to act to protect this special place. And so that is why we are working on this restoration blueprint. So the restoration blueprint is a community led effort. Um, it's been led through the Sanctuary Advisory Council. This is a group of citizens in the Florida Keys who volunteer to be a part of this board. They represent various different parts of the community, such as fishermen, scientists, 
educators, people in, working in tourism, diving, there's a, many different seats on this council. Um, these council members plus more than 35 community members came up with the initial suggestions in regard to the restoration blueprint. Since then there's been over 80 public meetings to solicit comment and feedback from individuals on this process. And there's been approximately 50,000 public comments received. In addition to that, there's been coordination amongst the various agencies. So we have the state agencies, that slide I showed earlier with all of those different people um, have all provided feedback in this restoration blueprint process. Um, and so what's basically happened with this is, as I mentioned, this is kind of a little timeline that shows you what's going on here. So there was this condition report. Um, based on the condition report, the advisory council began compiling input and conducting large scale public scoping to identify what should be done to address the concerns of, about the state of resources in the Florida Keys. The various agencies provided analysis and developed a suite of alternatives to look at changing potentially proposed changes to the rules and regulations and zones, et cetera, within the sanctuary to better protect this important place. All of these documents, all of these proposed alternatives were released in, as I mentioned, in 2019 as a part of this draft environmental impact statement or this restoration blueprint, and that was released for public comment. That public comment period was open for many months to receive comment from the public. That information has now been comp compiled, and our agents, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is reviewing that and providing responses. And then the next step will be to release a draft rule for public comment. So this draft rule will look at uh, compiling all the information that has come thus far to look at next steps for protecting our marine environment here in the Florida Keys. After this draft rule is released for public comment, there again will be an analysis of these comments and then a, a final environmental impact statement or rule will be released and then the final rule and marine zones will be implemented. Um, so essentially this is a federal process to look at the rules and regulations within the sanctuary and work towards protecting this special place. So you can find out more at this floridakeys.noah.gov slash blueprint uh, website and I encourage folks this process is open the National Marine Sanctuary System is a national system this process is open to all of those who are interested and engaged in the future of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and so I encourage you all to take a look and if you're interested participate in commenting for this draft rule uh, when it is released. And so I'm just going to provide uh, for those who may be interested my contact information if you have more questions about this process or other things that we discussed today. And then in addition to that, um, that is our the website for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is floridakeys.noaa.gov and everything I discussed today can be found on that website as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, so we are going to jump straight into questions. I do want to give a friendly reminder to everyone that the disaster preparedness sales tax holiday for hurricane season is this week. So make sure to get your hurricane supplies. Um, that holiday ends on Thursday. So go out and get your supplies tomorrow. Be prepared. Hurricane season is here. Um, it's my first one. So I got to do that as well. Um, but if anyone has any questions, please submit them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I am curious to hear from both of our panelists, um, what are the most important things that we as Floridians can be doing to not just not do any more harm, but actually protect the Florida Keys Sanctuary um, moving forward? Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in here and then I'll let you jump in as well, Chris, because I'm sure you'll be able to add. Um, I think the most important thing is uh, to have an understanding of what's happening, um, understand what the threats are, understand how they can be addressed. And I think by attending, by attending the webinar today, you are all taping the first step. So I commend you in that. Uh, and then participate. You know, uh, this is a public process. The Restoration Blueprint has been a public process from the beginning. And, and having informed citizens participate in that process is really essential. And then the other thing I would mention is we did review earlier in the presentation um, a couple different 
active community programs that are ways that you can get involved. When you recreate in these areas and you come to enjoy these areas, there's certain actions that you can take to help to protect them. And a lot of that has to do with preparing ahead of time, knowing where you're going to be and what the rules and regulations might be in that area, having the appropriate things with you to make sure you can minimize your impact on the environment um, and supporting people who are working to protect this place. That was very comprehensive. I would just say, um, you know, some of the biggest threats are global climate change. So you have a role, everybody, no matter where they are, ha have a role to play in minimizing your greenhouse gas emissions and supporting the transition to cleaner um, sources of energy in supporting reforestation, limiting deforestation. And uh, the next biggest concern is water quality. So particularly those that live in watersheds that flow into the Gulf of Mexico, your water, your, your pollution uh, flows through the Florida Keys and around our coral reefs and affects them. It may be a tiny drop in the bucket, but there are a lot of drops coming out of um, the Mississippi River, out of the Tampa Bay area, out of the Caloosahatchee River area. And those who may live on the East Coast are not off the hook because although the, the Gulf Stream runs north, there are counter currents that run south and we get, we get pollution from the mainland of the East Coast as well. And then as Marlies said, if you are going to use our, the natural resources in the Marine Sanctuary, I say our because I've been enjoying them my whole life, use them responsibly understand, you know, why uh, they are vulnerable, what makes them vulnerable, and how you can avoid causing harm while still having a good time out there. Awesome. We actually, I didn't realize we had a Q&A box and a chat box. I apologize. Um, but we did have a question in the Q&A box um, from Madeline or Madeline. Um, have y'all looked into dosing the corals under bleaching events? Um, I'm not quite sure how to say that word, but with Zozantele. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I won't say that I have, or I won't say that the sanctuary has. I would say that the sanctuary uh, and the Nature Conservancy, everybody that cares about these resources, gets a lot of um, information and support from the academic community. And I think. Um, Australia was mentioned, the Great Barrier Reef, but we've got some great academic partners in Florida, both at um, all of the universities, but the one that comes to mind is Dr. Andrew Baker at the University of Miami, where he is studying uh, precisely that, the relationships between corals, the coral animal, and the zooxanthellae, which is the algae that lives in their tissues that photosynthesizes and gives them food in exchange for shelter. Um, and it is a breakdown in that relationship that causes coral bleaching. And there's a lot of um, very interesting uh, work uh, at, you know, getting the right sort of algae matched up with the corals so that they can better withstand the impacts of uh, the warming ocean. So I, I don't think we're at the point now where we can take that information and, you know, operationalize it and use it, but it's moving in that direction and it's really fascinating work. Awesome. We also have a question from Leah. Um, have you seen any noticeable changes or improvements in reef health or in species abundance since COVID, the pandemic has kind of begun? No, um, the reef doesn't respond that quickly. It's only been two months since we've all been or so since we've all been uh, on relative lockdown. There is um, an interesting dynamic going on in Key West where a lot of people are noting that the water is clearer than it has been for a long time. And a lot of people are attributing that to changes in the amount of boating activity and especially uh, large cruise ship activity that stirs up silt on the bottom of the ocean as, they, as these ships come into Key West. Now, that is, you know, Maybe uh, it's anecdotal at this point. I think that some serious scientific study would be necessary before one could say definitively that that has made a difference and it wasn't just a, a, a stretch of calm weather or what have you, but it certainly is plausible. And as a, I have, although I've been uh, working from home and so on, I have been able to go out on the ocean and there's simply a lot less people using 
the ocean right now. Uh, there are fewer boaters, there are fewer divers and fishermen, and that's taking some of the pressure off of these resources. Um, now, the, the downside to that, remember my economic figures, um, that's really hurting the economy of the Florida Keys right now. And the Florida Keys just opened up for visitation with all of the appropriate precautions yesterday. Uh, and I know a lot of fishing charter captains, a lot of dive operators, hoteliers, restaurants, you name it, they are um, very excited to get some business back and I can't blame them. But it's been an interesting, uh, an interesting time. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I just want to um, kind of add on to what Chris just said about the fact that the Florida Keys has opened up again and t linking back to that question of what can people do to protect this place. I think um, doing things like looking up Blue Star recognized operators when you come down to visit the Florida Keys and again knowing where you're going and what you're doing is going to minimize the impacts on these various resources that are experiencing so many different impacts that every time we have an opportunity to minimize that, you're going to give the environment a, a chance to recover. And I think a lot of these areas are really resilient and are able to bounce back from impacts um, when we can minimize the threats that they face. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. If anyone submits a question within the next minute, I'm just going to say some closing words and we can we can definitely add your question on. Um, but I wanted to thank Chris and Marlise again. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so great to hear from you guys and, and absorb all of your knowledge about the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, in honor of World Oceans Day, we're going to have more oceans webinars and oceans related work coming up this summer, including an activity for kids to get involved in oceans. Um, and more about seagrass. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, I also want to let, let everyone know that on Thursday, um, it is the anniversary of the BP oil spill um, touching Florida's coast. And we're gonna be having a webinar at, at 1030 for anyone that's interested. Um, Jenna, would you like to say anything more about that? Yeah, it's been um, 10 years on Thursday since oil washed up on the Florida coastline. So we are going to be joined on Thursday at 1030 a.m. Um, alongside Oceana, Florida, Florida Conservation Voters and Healthy Gulf um, to commemorate that. Um, we'll also be joined by um, U.S. Representative Charlie Crist um, to give his remarks, as well as a panelist, that, uh, a panel, um, including uh, Dr. Ian McDonald, um, Jim Cox. Um, oh gosh, I'm missing people, but we have a really wonderful panel lined up of experts to talk about all of the different aspects of how that has impacted Florida in both the past, the present, and how it'll impact us moving forward. Thank you. And then specific to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, we will be sending out updates when it is time to do that next comment period. So definitely pay attention to our emails. If you guys have any questions for our panelists, feel free to reach out to Environment Florida and we can put you in contact with them if you miss their contact info. This webinar will also be on Environment Florida's Facebook page. So lots of resources there. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I don't, I don't see any questions that have popped up. Um, so I think that that will conclude there. And thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great, wonderful rest of their day. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, bye thank bye, you everybody. Very much. Bye, guys.